Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and you're looking at Sea Dragon, the largest, most ridiculous rocket that ever came into creation, at least on paper. This rocket almost existed in real life and in this video we're going to explore what this rocket is all about, why it didn't actually succeed and we're going to recreate it right here in Kerbal Space Program and okay, things didn't really go well for us just now. We're going to launch it and we're going to find out how it performs in real life. Welcome to What The Math. So this right here is a tremendously large rocket. This is the largest rocket ever designed and was very, very, very close to being created as well. Unfortunately, due to funding constraints and due to the fact that US, um, specifically when this rocket was developed, actually got into the Vietnam War and was basically running out of funds, this rocket had to be cancelled and so they never really got to develop it. But they tested two prototypes and, well, okay, not exactly this kind of a prototype. As a matter of fact, the prototype was much, much smaller, um, but they actually did get to test uh, the smaller version of the Sea Dragon, known as Sea Bee and uh, Sea Horse. But before we go on, let's actually talk a little bit more about the ideas behind this rocket, why it was actually very, very um, brilliant in some sense, and also talk a little bit more about um, what's inside and what's outside. So first of all, this was not the correct way of launching Sea Dragon, and you'll see in a second why. I'm going to just let it stand there for a few seconds, and you'll find out very, very shortly why this was not the right way to launch this rocket. And the answer to that is basically weight. It was so ridiculously large and so ridiculously overweight that there was no way it was going to support its own weight. It was just simply too, too big. Uh, and so for this reason, um, the uh, person, oh wow, it's actually bouncing around. The person who designed, developed, and basically drew the plans for this uh, rocket by the name of Robert Truax, uh, who was working for Aerojet uh, back in the days. Uh, this was in 1962, by the way, so over 50 years ago. Realized that it was actually much easier, much cheaper, and much more beneficial if you create and sort of start this rocket horizontally, just like you see right here. Now, it wasn't actually going to start on the ground. The idea here was brilliant. Why don't you just instead start this rocket horizontally in the water? And this is where the brilliancy, or I guess the ingenuity of the designer comes into play. He realized that you can actually create a much, much cheaper rocket um, if you start making this as a ship in a harbor that already sort of exists. So just like we would make a submarine, specifically actually um, a nuclear submarine, you could use the same principles to create the hull for this rocket, no larger than a typical submarine, and then using very similar principles, but combining them with the rocket science, turn this into a rocket that would sort of align itself vertically, and I'll show you how it would do this in real life, and then basically launch into space. Now we're going to recreate all of this, and by the way, uh, the model that I found for this rocket and also all of the sort of um, references are in the description below, so you can check it out by yourself. All of the files are there as well. Here is what a typical launch would look like. So first of all, you build the rocket. It would first be dragged by a tugboat that you see right here uh, into a deeper water, not too far from the shore. This is where things would get actually interesting. Uh, the paper that was written about this particular rocket and also a lot of the design um, revolved around using nuclear uh, carriers to then uh, create fuel right there on the spot for this rocket. So it would actually not be fueled um, after the production, it would be fueled in the ocean. And the way that it would be fueled is by using electrolysis which is the reaction you get uh, when you put uh, an electrolyte, basically any kind of electrical conductor into water and it produces oxygen and hydrogen. And this way you can actually produce the entire uh, supply of fuel for the rocket right there on the spot. But the idea was to use the nuclear reactor from an extremely large and extremely powerful nuclear carrier um, that would then sort of also escort the mission and basically provide the needed um, defense support. Once the rocket was fueled, it would then uh, fill up this ballast tank that's basically attached to the engine on the bottom with water. And this would give it an extra weight to essentially sink the rocket uh, deeper 
and thus align it vertically. And we're going to see how this works in real life using Kerbal Space Program. Real life Kerbal Space Program, what? Anyway, um, all of this would then uh, sort of float here. And uh, because the level of water would align with basically the second stage, you could then fill up the second stage with any kind of mission materials. You can also put personnel here. And the idea here was that uh, you would use the lower stage as a kind of a booster. Basically, these are known as big dumb boosters. Uh, and basically, the, their main purpose here was to launch the upper stage into higher orbit. And there's actually two stages here. There's the large uh, engine whose size you can see right here compared to the typical Kerbals that are about a meter or three feet high. And uh, this was the uh, first engine. So there's only one basically booster engine right here on the bottom. Extremely, extremely powerful, uh, powerful enough to basically lift the entire platform uh, to an altitude of about 40 kilometers. And then the second stage was uh, inside here, along with these four control engines that you see on the screen right now. These were used to basically stabilize the ascent and to kind of align the rocket uh, to a proper um, inclination. Oh, and by the way, the second engine is right here. It's actually hidden right now. There it is. So this was the second st uh, stage, a little bit smaller, but also just as powerful and just as large as the, as the first one, maybe a little bit smaller than the first one. So altogether, this would actually provide enough boost to uh, not just lift any weight, but to even lift the entire second stage of the Saturn V rocket. This is how powerful this was. And this was kind of the idea here. Uh, it would be enough to provide enough boost to put a large enough spaceship into orbit to then propel it to Mars. So the idea for this extremely large and extremely bulky rocket, which was actually too bulky for its own good, would be to uh, deliver the first American to Mars. This was actually the only mission that, that was kind of planned. And um, the idea was actually pretty brilliant because the booster itself, the dumb booster itself, could easily lift up to 550 tons of mass into lower Earth orbit. This was enough to then basically propel it to Mars. And so this is kind of where you would be putting it right here. Now, um, the rocket itself was actually not efficient at all. As a matter of fact, it was not meant to be efficient. It was meant to be really cheap. So the materials used here were extremely cheap. It was basically um, steel, as cheap as it can get. And um, the production costs themselves were also very cheap because it would be made in a similar fashion that you would make a submarine or a ship. And what's even more uh, interesting about this is that the stages were meant to be recycled and reused as well. As a matter of fact, when they tried this with smaller versions so like CB and Seahorse, they were able to recycle the engines, making the uh, reuse uh, cost of the rocket extremely, extremely low. And so this here would then possibly have a parachute or something attached to it um, that would kind of slow down the splashdown um, when it approaches the uh, water and basically the engine would then be retrieved and reused as well. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use this horizontal version of Sea Dragon and launch it into, uh, well, really as high as we can because these are boosters, this is not a complete rocket, um, and try to see how it all works and how it was supposed to work and if it actually even functions at all. So we first has to have to actually place it in the water. And for this, I'm going to be using one of the mods called HyperEdit. And so here it is floating in the water, just like it would in real life, except that of course, uh, we don't see the aircraft carrier that was supposed to fill it up with fuel and also the tugboat that would deliver it here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to fill the ballast tank and it's actually really cool how it's done in this mod. Uh, all we we'll have to do for this is Right here, we're going to, um, I think I just have to engage it and uh, it will automatically, oh, here we go. Start filling up with water, which will actually uh, start sort of lifting the rocket vertically. And this is a pretty brilliant uh, idea and it's actually something that uh, was tested and worked just fine. As a matter of fact, um, back in 1962, this was the preferred method of launch because it required no um, launch platform whatsoever, and it made uh, the actual launch a lot safer than it would be otherwise. Obviously not for the fish next to the rocket, but for people. 
And interestingly, um, this method would actually even today be very, very beneficial if we had uh, tried it back in the days. Unfortunately, today we require a lot of preparation for the launches and we actually use a very, very, very expensive um, launch platforms, which this didn't require at all. So here we go. This is a vertical sort of positioning. And uh, the way that the rocket would be launched then is you would first start the engine and then as soon as it's um, running and powerful enough, you would release it and it would ba basically launch the rocket into space. So let's try this. We're going to engage the engine and uh, we'll then basically just watch it from this angle as everything sort of occurs in real time. So this clamp will release the rocket and the ballast tank will then basically no longer hold the rocket, which would then lift into space. And as you can see, these engines here were basically used for uh, maneuvering and positioning. And so this is kind of how all of this works. And then once the first stage runs out of fuel, which will happen anytime now, actually, um, this engine will be released. It sort of has its uh, its own uh, system of delivery and retrieval with the parachute attached to it somewhere on the inside. Unfortunately, we don't actually have this in this mod. Um, so now what we're going to do is engage our second engine, which will start anytime now. And we also need to actually retrieve it from the inside, I believe. Uh, by clicking this right here. And so now we have our second stage that uh, delivers the uh, the actual um, weight and the actual package that is located right here underneath the um, the large fairings here. Now, unfortunately for us right now, we don't have anything inside. As a matter of fact, it's completely empty. Uh, but typically, this is where you would hold your rocket and all of your other stuff that would then be delivered to Mars. So all in all, this is actually an extremely, extremely powerful uh, booster, you wouldn't really call it a typical rocket because this is really just a dumb booster meant to deliver an actual rocket that would be hidden here. And interestingly, this was actually one of the first times that reusable rockets were even sort of envisioned, uh, 55 years before Elon Musk was able to actually do it. Uh, so here the idea was that the actual engine, which I think already fell, uh, would then descend uh, down into the uh, lower atmosphere and basically a parachute would be then used to kind of slow down the descent and the actual landing. And once it crashes into the water, um, the uh, inflatable system would then prevent it from sinking and it could then be retrieved and reused again. And because of the actual cheapness of all of the materials and all of the actual um, parts here, you could actually launch uh, a tremendous amount of materials into space relatively cheap by those standards. Now, unfortunately, this program never actually saw the, the uh, light of day, mostly because of the Vietnam War, but also because the uh, scientists studying this particular program realized that, well, in long term, just to develop this rocket, just to basically have the logistics necessary for it, it would actually cost something like $22 billion. And it was unfortunately a little bit beyond the budget they had at this time, mostly because of the war. But nevertheless, I think this was actually a pretty awesome uh, idea and it definitely inspired a lot of the scientists uh, after this. But unfortunately, no other um, similar vessel was ever envisioned or designed. The biggest rocket or the second biggest rocket after this was, of course, Saturn V. But interestingly, when you compare the two, you'll actually realize that you can totally place this whole second stage right here into the upper stage here. And it would actually be able to carry it. Now, I think I'm, I'm going to try to recreate this in one of the future videos. I'm going to actually see if I, we can deliver the second stage of Saturn V into low Earth orbit using Kerbal Space Program and using this humongous rocket. And this is actually people for comparison. You can see that this is a tremendously large uh, design. But nevertheless, it's actually true that uh, Elon Musk's BFR uh, with its secondary stage is technically larger, but since it's not developed just yet and we don't really know the exact specifications for it, um, it's still a speculation. So as of now, Sea Dragon still stands as the largest rocket ever designed that was almost ready for production. And meanwhile, our Sea Dragon that was launched for in Kerbal Space Program from uh, the Kerbal Space Center um, is now falling back into Earth because I didn't really give it enough boost to put it into orbit. Now, in one of the future videos, like I said, I want to try to see if we can attach a Saturn V uh, second stage to it and basically launch this tremendously large design um, in low Earth orbit. 
And so what I'm going to do in one of the future videos is basically uh, take this part off and put the Saturn V rocket right here just to see if we can pull it off and if we can actually make it work just as it was designed. Anyway, do come back and watch the next video where this is going to happen and hopefully you'll enjoy this as well. And if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe. Share this video with someone who enjoys watching uh, space videos and wants to learn about science using video games and possibly support this channel on Patreon as well because it does help me a lot. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video. Space out, and as always, bye-bye. And meanwhile, let's see what happens if we actually launch this rocket right here from this position on the launch pad. So far, so good. Ready, steady, and... Okay, that did not really work as I planned. We launched something, but not in the right direction. And there seems to be water here as well. And look at that, we're actually flying! Okay, so never mind, I spoke too soon. It worked after all. Pretty amazing if you ask me. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.